So at, uh, today in this AmphiBioClean, there will be the NEXA workshop for biodiversity funding and, uh, and opportunities as, at a European level. So please, it's open to everyone. Uh, just come, come to the AmphiBioClean. It will start at 1 p.m. Uh, there is the rest restoration workshop uh, that will happen today. So the date, the time here is not right. I j they just told me that it will be at um, 12.30. Can I have a confirmation from the people from Lawrence or 12.30, sorry, 12.30 uh, in room D2, the same room. And tonight we have a social dinner at the Villa du Département. So the bus will depart at six, between 6.40, 6.45 p.m. So after the poster session, we just go back to where the excursion days were yesterday and we go directly to the Villa du Département. For those who are not attending the social dinner, the buses will drop you after that at your hotels. Uh, if you have any doubt, if you are in the list of registered people for the social dinner, you can directly go see our staff at the, at the desk and, and confirm your attendance for tonight. We'll, the buses will uh, then depart from the Villa du Département in the evening around 10, 10.30. There is still the best poster competition running, so today again, and it will be open for the poster competition of today until tomorrow, tomorrow 11 p.m., but notice that there will be a shorter time for uh, voting for tomorrow because the, posters, the poster session will be happening at midday. So you can vote only until 2.30 uh, p.m. that we can elect the best posters of the day. So Vox vote and enter the code and please vote. We need more, more participants to the voting, so I really, uh, really want you to, to vote, please. And for those who haven't attended, the, the photo exhibition is like a free entrance in the Faculty of Sciences for the Eparsis and Antarctic Islands exhibition and the insect exhibition in the, in the library. So it's indicated on the map. Please, you are welcome to visit this. Thank you very much, and I would like to call Jose Maria Fernandez Palacios to chair this plenary session. Have a good morning. Bonjour. Thanks for being here again the next day. So I have the very big pleasure to present the, our first keynote speaker of today. She is Susan Renner. Susan is professor of botany. She, ISO has been professor of botany in different universities like Aarhus in Denmark, Mainz, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, or St. Louis, Missouri in the States. She has also been elected member of the Academic of Science of the Royal uh, Danish Academy of Science, the Bavarian, the German, and the American Academy of Science. She has been very active in different topics related with island biogeography and island paleoecology. And in the last time, she has uh, been working very hard with and plant interactions in Fiji, or in the response of plant to different cl climates. So, Susan, please. I forgot to give the title of her talk. <laughs> it is Orchids, Moths, and Birds on Madagascar, Mauritius, and Reunion Island System with Well Constrained Time Frames for Species Interactions and Trade Change. Okay. So, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yes, and I want to start my talk with drawing attention to the people to whom we owe most of what we know about the flora of Réunion and the ecology and phylogeny of the orchids I will be concentrating on. And these are, in particular, Thérésien Cadet, who started the herbarium in Réunion, uh, the ecologist Thierry Payet, who has long been interested in the reproductive ecology of, in particular, orchids on Réunion. His student, Claire Michenot, who did her PhD under his advice here in 2010. He, she's now in Australia. Uh, a colleague from Madagascar, who did his PhD in Canada, supported by the, in Montreal, by the Canadian Orchid Society, on a group that I will be mentioning a lot. And then a, uh, group of people um, from West Africa, 
in particular Muriel Simon Droza and her husband Tariq Steve, uh, no, Vincent, Vincent uh, um, Droza and their colleague uh, Tariq Stevar. These people work between um, Cameroon, uh, Brussels, Université Libre in Brussels, and Missouri Botanical Garden. And much of what I will be showing today, some of what I will be showing today is based on their work. A couple of weeks ago, a paper came out that provided the perfect framework for my talk, although I saw it after I submitted my abstract and title. And this is a paper from the group of Holger Kreft, about, uh, in which they analyzed the distribution of some over 20,000, no, 27,000 species of orchids based on plots and local floras and florolas and focusing on the question of how well orchids would be represented on oceanic islands. And what you see in this particular graph here is that Réunion, shown here, is really an outstandingly diverse in orchids. What you see is the proportional representation, the proportion that orchids make up of the vascular flora of these uh, 395 islands that they analyzed and compared with mainland diversity. And I won't be saying more about this analysis because several of the authors are here and have given talk or will be giving talk about this, this analysis and its you know, impact, uh, implications. Amanda Taylor, uh, Patrick Weigelt, uh, Professor Kraft himself, and Christian Kienig. So what they found was that in most oceanic islands, orchids make up less than 1% of the local vascular floras, but on Réunion, the orchids make up something like 23%. Of course, these percentages always depend very much on what you assume to be the total diversity of vascular floras. But it doesn't matter whether it's 18% or 27%. Réunion and likewise Mauritius is undoubtedly disproportionate, disproportionately rich in orchids. Well, the orchids make up a lot of the local flora. Unusually so. And though this provides a perfect framework for me for the two questions I will be addressing in this talk, which are what is special about Réunion and Mauritius in terms of their orchid diversity? What explains or what may explain this extraordinary diversity of orchids? And I also want to be talking about whether it's the diverse pollinators or local radiations. And of course, these two factors could be related. Oh, sorry, let's get the numbers. This is from NPR, let's get the numbers. <laughs> so, Réunion has 212 orchids in 36 genera, and Mauritius has 217 orchid species in 39 genera. There are also five subspecies in each case. Of these endemics, there are 12 endemics on Réunion, as far as known, and nine on Mauritius. And there's also a genus called Anodia, which is endemic to these two islands. The species with color photos, this is important because I, I was amazed. I was able to download close-up photos of the flowers of 157 species of these and 163 of these. And I think there can be no other tropical family, a diverse family, for which you can download close-up pictures of the flowers because so many people are you know, cultivating orchids, are fascinated by orchids, and so they put online these, these pictures. It's just amazing. This, of course, helped me to assess, at least for one group, and I will explain which one, the pollinators, the likely pollinators. Okay, so species with DNA sequences in GenBank. So 67 of these have sequences in GenBank and 84 of these have sequences in GenBank. There are no DNA sequences of any of the Réunion endemics and there are two DNA sequences of the Mauritius endemics. Okay, and species with published pollinator observations, pollinators observed and published eight on Réunion and none from Mauritius. Species with pollinators extrapolated from the floral morphology. 
Okay, 22 sphingids, 67 moths, 18 flies, 20, no, 10 bees, 4 here, um, class dogamas. And I will explain now how I got to these numbers and I will also show this in pictures. Of all the floral syndromes, the one that is best defined, best ex can best be extrapolated from morphology and some traits is the sphingid pollination syndrome. If you are pollinated by a large moth, you have a large spur, a long spur with nectar, okay? And you are open at night, you're usually white and star-shaped, you are usually perfumed. And although not all of these traits are obviously apparent from pictures, if you have a combination of the species description and the pictures, and in some cases published observations, it is fairly safe to infer whether an orchid is pollinated by a sphingid moth or not. For the other extrapolations, one has to be much more careful, as you will see. Okay, so based on this approach, we have pollinators observed eight, as I said, from Réunion, inferred 97, mostly moth pollinated, and unknown 107. And for Mauritius, the situation is that none have been, at least not published, inferred 98, based on the same approach, and unknown 119. So that's the database. Now, to infer if there's a local radiation, obviously we need a molecular phylogeny. And we have, luckily, molecular phylogenies for at least two very diverse groups. So here are the largest groups, clades, and in bold are those that have clock-dated phylogenies. And so we have the Angricum group, 66 species on Réunion, 68 on Mauritius, none endemic, or two endemic, none endemic, and Bulbophyllum, which is also pretty diverse and also has an excellent molecular phylogeny. However, there are other large genera, such as this one, which 41 species, 38 species, none of them sequenced. And these are the next largest genera. So, but at least for two clades, we do have clock-dated phylogenies and hence can make some inference about whether they're local radiations or not. I want to show just one of these phylogenies, okay? Just for you to get a sense. This is a phylogeny of Angricum, done by these people. These are, they're actually two phylogenies. And all you need to see here is the yellow. This is the genus Angricum, okay? It's all over the place. And so, the Angricum, the Angricoid genera found on Réunion and Mauritius are the ones that are marked, and it's all over. And so you immediately get a sense that we really can't trust morphology. Any inference about local radiations or where species come from has to come from molecular phylogenies. It has been too difficult to infer natural relationships from floral morphology. And that's all I want you to get out of this, out of this tree. Okay, so let's start. So these are my inferred uh, pollination syndromes, or in some cases published. And I want to start with the flies and automatic selfing and clastogamy. Here is this large, uh, representatives of this large genus Bulbophyllum. They look huge on the picture, but believe me, these are tiny flowers, like two, three millimeters, terrible. I wonder what these guys ever, and this uh, doctoral student and these two doctoral students of Peter Gomez ever focused on this genus. Okay, and so here's this excellently sampled clock dated phylogeny. All right, and here is one of the many bulbophyllums that they studied, not in Réunion, but in Madagascar. This is fly pollinated. They are, as far as known, all fly pollinated. Here is one a small drosophilid fly with the pollinaria. Okay, now there's one neat thing about Bulbophyllum and also many other orchids once you have understood the morphology and that is a thing called Rostellum. I marked it here with red arrows. So you have the pollen packages up here and then you have this little flap, Rostellum, it's just a tissue and then you have the female receptive surface. 
And yesterday, when some of us visited the vanilla production uh, cooperative, we learned, or some of us learned about the rostellum, because if you want to self-pollinate vanilla, you need to remove this rostellum. You just use a pincer, take it out. Because once you remove the rostellum, then the pollen sacs, the pollen packages can bend forward and reach the receptive stigma. And so when you have, the, once you've developed the eye for this, you can look at a bulbophyllum flower, tiny as it is, and infer whether it is an outcrosser or a selfer, because the outcrossers all have the rostellum, and the selfers have no rostellum or a reduced rostellum. And though this enables you to infer the mating system from the morphology. All right? And in some species, like these two here, the species are polymorphic for mating systems. So there are populations or individuals that, are, that have the rostellum, and there are others that lack the rostellum, and those, of course, are self or have a reduced rostellum. Okay? And now if they look, this is unpublished data, if you look at the distribution of these things, the populations, what they found is this. On Madagascar, you have the two species, okay, distributed in different uh, habitats, dry forest and wet forest, that it diverged in the early Pleistocene. Both are polymorphic. And on Réunion, you have just one species, one of the two species. And so, and remember, this species is polymorphic for mating system here. And they investigated lots of populations, 14 populations of the one species, 48 of the other species, seven populations with 100, oh, I gave the wrong, here's the populations and here's the uh, individuals. And what they found was that while both species are polymorphic for mating system on Madagascar, all the individuals, the 156 individuals that they studied on Réunion, are fixed for selfing. So we have a neat example here of the evolution of selfing in small populations on islands, either by the automatic selection advantage that you get from selfing, you know, getting more of your genes into the next population, or reproductive assurance, which I find hard to accept because, uh, uh, to imagine, because you would think that these drosophila, these little flies would be everywhere. But that is for them to discuss in their paper. Okay, so this is a wonderful example of selfing on islands. There are, is at least one other fly-pollinated orchid that has been published on from, uh, by the work here, by people from, work by people from the University de Réunion. For example, this one, Gastrodia similis. This is a species that occurs both on Réunion and Madagascar, uh, on, on, on Mauritius. And it is um, pollinated by this fly. You see here how perfectly this fly fits with the orchid. It's a super interesting system because this fly is lured by the orchid's scent, which resembles the scent of a mushroom in which the fly normally lays its eggs. A really intricate case. Unfortunately, neither the plant nor the fly have been sequenced. It would be so easy to infer the age of this interaction, or at least of the divergences from the next closest relative. Okay, so this was my excursion, or our excursion, into fly pollination and selfing. Now let's switch to birds and crickets. Uh, Madagascar, no, Réunion is rich in sostrops, <laughs> at least they are abundant, white eyes, as you know, and these pollinate at least two of the ungraquid orchids. You see here the orchids, and here's the white eye. And on Monday, uh, Thierry Payet showed a little movie video uh, that is also actually associated with this paper, so you can see it online, uh, of the white eyes taking nectar from the orchid and carrying the pollinia. And in the abstracts, in one of the abstracts for this meeting, Christophe Thibault writes, the Réunion white eye, Sostrops bobonicus, endemic species, is a species complex that harbors four geographically structured forms because of intra-island divergence. It is sister to the other white eye from Mauritius. So it would be very interesting to infer whether there is any difference in the preferences for the local orchids. You know, we need 
data to, to address that is at least possible. For the crickets, again, this is work from the lab of uh, Thierry with his student Claire Michenot, where they discovered the two endemic crickets, a new species of crickets, in fact pollinate and, and at least two ungraquid orchids. And again, there is a video where you can see these crickets carrying the pollinia and transferring to pollinia. There's really not some oddity. It is truly the pollinator. These crickets truly are the regular pollinators of at least two species of orchids. And Terry on Monday and also in their paper showed this phylogeny here, or a set, subset of a phylogeny where we see Orchid species, this is an orchid phylogeny, this is angraecum, and some are moth pollinated. And here's the cricket pollinated two species, they're very close to each other, okay? And here are some, or the published white eye pollinated species. And I will come back to this cricket later in my talk. Okay? So, for the remainder, I will focus on moth pollinated species because that's what I know most about and have worked on the most. I'm not going to talk about bee pollination because of orchids on Réunion or this region because amazingly I haven't found a modern publication focusing on bee pollinated orchids. All right, so, Madag oh, sorry. Madagascar, Mauritius, and Réunion have 12 to 17 hawk moth species, non-endemic, and I've listed here these hawk moth species, and there are at least 280 species of moths that were collected in Réunion in 218 alone at 10 sites by Roger Kitching, and there are some 700 species of moths on Réunion, 700 species. Now these hawk moths are interesting because, super interesting in fact, because Several of them, the ones marked with the word migrant, have these amazing distributions, basically from Denmark to Australia or New Zealand. It's amazing. Very wide ranging. Okay? This one, this one, this one, and this one. There's none that is endemic to Réunion or Mauritius. And the ones in green will come up later in my talk. So naturally, for a moth that is that widely distributed, it is encountering and using numerous flowers, it's clear, for food. And here are illustrations of a few of the flowers used for nectar as nectar sources by this one here, this very widespread from Europe throughout Australia, okay? So here it is using an invasive Asian species, this is photographed in Africa. Here it's using a crinum, another crinum, an ipomea, a gardenia, another, no, it's the same gardenia, havea, and so on and so forth. Of course, these moths use many flowers for nectar. So the one <laughs> angraecoid orchid that's probably best known is this one, because Darwin received in a Wardian cage one individual with three blooms that he then studied over several weeks. Okay, and knowing British orchids and British hawk moth pollinated orchids, he immediately inferred that this thing had to be pollinated by some long-tongued hawk moth. It wasn't that difficult. Sorry, Darwin. <laughs> okay, and it is amazing the spur can be up to. This is a, a, an individual we have in the Munich, or a bloom photographed in the Munich Botanical Garden. So it's worth reading what Darwin actually said or wrote about this orchid. Let me read it. Okay, I underlined it here. Okay. Uh, as certain moths on Madagascar became oh here, larger through natural selection in relation to their general conditions of life, either in their larval or mature state, get this, he was thinking about allometry, or as the proboscis alone was lengthened to obtain honey from the angricum and other long tongue flowers, those individual plants of the angricum which had the longest nectaries, and the nectary varies a lot in length in some orchids, and which consequently compelled the moth to insert its proboscis 
would be the best first in life. He has everything in there. He has larval or mature stage. He has the variation in orchid spur length. He has angricum and other orchids. It's really super. You know, I was so careful and so thoughtful. All right? But the one who really predicted that a moth would be found on Madagascar and that that moth would be a form of, from the genus Xanthopan was Wallace. And when Rothschild and Jordan named the subspecies predictor, they did this to honor Wallace, not Darwin. They mentioned this specifically. The, orc this, the moth was put in a different genus at the time, this genus uh, Marcelia. It was later transferred to a different genus, but they specifically mentioned that Wallace and the British Museum measured the proboscises of moths and predicted that a subspecies would be found on, on uh, Madagascar. And in fact, it had already been collected. The two specimens they used, a male and a female, the two specimens they used to describe this new subspecies had in fact been collected in 1820 and 1841. They existed in the collection, all right? And they described the new subspecies because this male and this female uh, had different color patterns, both on the abdomen and on the wings, okay? Quite distinct, based on the two specimens. All right. Now this was first documented the interaction between the moth and the orchid was first documented. Okay, let me go back. Go, go on back. Go on back. I want to name the person. Excuse me. Okay, sorry. This I really want to point out here. Professor Thilo Wassertal in 1992 made this video, this historic video, which I will show you now. It was made between the 9th and the 31st of August, 1992. He and his wife put up flight cages in Madagascar and stayed there for long times. Over several years they visited and they had large cages. And they put orchids in the cages and moths and were able to film this, okay, at this location here. A large flight cage on the rocky coast of, uh, for, uh, north of Fort Dauphin. And I really, now I'm gonna show this. It's very grainy, very <laughs> short. And anybody interested in this video, please email me because I want to distribute it with the permission, of course, of, of Tilo, so that it's on many computers and isn't lost. Okay, so can you please play it? It's very grainy. This is Kantuhan Morgani Predictor taking nectar from Angricum sesquipedale, as first documented in 1992. Thank you. So anybody who wants it can have it. Now, very interesting, the, most, the second video that is cited all the time as the first documentation of this interaction was made by Phil de Vries. It's much better than the first one, okay? But the interesting thing is that the location is unknown. Let me read this wonderful quote. And it's, again, it's with, Phil is great, okay, he knows. Hi, Suzanne, the locality for the film, hmm, I recall lots of driving around to various sites with being jet, while jet-lagged but the locality would be in the brain of the then producer of the Great Jungle series, Robert Bernick, Barrington. At the time, he was working for a British production company in Green Umbrella. I have not heard from him, from or of him for many years, and I think Green Umbrella is defunct. Let me ask around to see if I can track the locality down or someone who might know. Prod me once in a while <laughs> so he doesn't get, it doesn't get lost. But it's lost, I tell you. I've prodded him in vain. So the location where this great BBC movie is really good, I mean, it's, again, it's seconds, is lost. Anyway, the, ex <laughs> the moth interacts with the orchid and pollinates it and we, it's documented. It's not unknown. Okay, so here's the geographic range of Xantovan Morgani. Here it is on, in Africa. This is from GBIF, okay, it's probably many more locations. And here it is on Madagascar. Come on. All right. And there are also pictures of Xantofan Morgani visiting orchids in Africa, mainland Africa. This is a picture from Steve Johnson. And I put this red, this is Xantofan Morgani. And I put this in, the, in Kenya. I put this red line here to help you see those, if I, if I blew up this picture, you would see that the proboscis is extended and goes all the way to down here. It is really visible when you, you know, zoom into this picture. 
and the moth is doing everything to get its po you know, to, to, to position itself right to get that tongue into the spur of this particular orchid. And I'll come back to that later. So the variation in Xanthophan morgani is amazing, the size variation, not only between males and females, but also over the range of its species. So here you see some specimens from La Gambia, West Africa. This specimen is the only one from Madagascar. This is actually a drawing, okay? These others are photographs. This is a drawing, but it is proportional. So you can see the size variation right there, and I will show even more, it will become apparent even more on the next slide. This is the proboscis length variation just within that subspecies predictor. Here's proboscis length in centimeters, and, so, and, and, and the sex is also given here, okay, male, female. So look at this. The proboscis can vary from 14.7 centimeter to 30 centimeter within this subspecies. This is super important for everybody to really get it, okay? From 14 to 30. Within the subspecies Morganii, <laughs> which tells us a lot about, you know, inserting your proboscis all the way and getting the pollinarium in a particular place. Hmm? All right. So now let's look at the nectar variation. This is again from Thilo Wassertal's work, and he studied lots of flowers. Here you see the nectar column in some 50 individual flowers. And of course it varies a lot because some flowers have just been visited, so they're empty, it takes time for the spur to fill. Some are under water stress, they're sun exposed, whatever. You expect variation in the nectar column for many causes, and one cause is super interesting, which is shown here. These flowers here are before the pollinarium has been removed, okay? So they are like in the male stage. Now the pollinarium will be removed, okay? These flowers here are after the pollinarium has been removed, and they produce much more nectar. And that makes perfect sense. Because once you have exported your gametes, you are waiting to import gametes. You must be visited at least twice. But plausibly, many more visits are necessary to import pollinaria. You have to have a moth that has the right pollinaria on its tongue to come to you. And how do you do this? By producing more nectar in the female stage. Right? So this is why all female stage angrecum, this is of course true of all, the, of all these, produce much more nectar in the female stage. And again, this makes us think about, you know, the proboscis inserted in a particular way to take all the nectar. There's got to be tons of variation. All right. Now the particular moss that is shown here, the tongue length, how it varies and whether it will reach the nectar, is actually on Réunion, both on Madagascar and Réunion. These measurements were made in Madagascar, but there are species that are also on Réunion. All right. Now I got interested in see, finding out how old this stuff is, this interaction. And so I got a master student shown here, Christoph Netz, to download and, uh, the sequences. We also sequence very little, very little of our own. And, uh, code, or at first tabulate and then code, the spur length and the tongue length. And you get this information easily because every orchid that is named has a description, a protologue, and in that description is the spur length. You may not get the full variation, but you do get the spur length, at least roughly, so you can code it as long or short or something. And we did it in different ways. Okay, so he downloaded for all these orchids there, that we, you know, 144 or something, the spur length, it's shown here, it's in the online supporting material of our paper. Réunion has 15 angrecum species with spurs lo longer than 8 centimeters, and the longest spur on Réunion is 15 centimeters, based on literature. Okay, here are a few of the long spurred angrecum from Réunion, from these online pictures I downloaded. All right? And so, here you see 
The spur length, the evolution of spur lengths, here's the phylogeny, and I will show it one more time with the names and the distribution. But for here, we just need, for this slide, I only wanted to show you the spur lengths, okay? Spur lengths evolution on muscarine and Madagascan and Griquids. And what you see is the very long spur with 35 centimeters. Those are rare. Here's one species with a super long spur, and here's another one. Here's the An Angrecum sesquipedale and its sister. The sister already has a super long spur. So the very long spur must have evolved in the common ancestor of these two guys. And I marked again this one here, this moth, and a very closely related Angrecum are on Réunion. And mind you, the red is very long, but this pale blue, this color is already 10 centimeters, and you can see that this pale blue is here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, okay? So lots of long tongue, and also short spurred ones. It goes back and forth. It's not that the long spur is in one clade, definitely not. All right. Now for the proboscis lengths, our sampling is maybe not quite as good, okay? Madagascar sphingids, about 200, and we have, I don't know, 100 something in the, in the phylogeny here, and of the, uh, the ones on Madagascar and Réunion, we have some outgroups, of course, uh, eight of the 12 or 17. And these are the proboscis lengths, which again, you can download from this ec excellent literature. And what we see is that here is very long. Red is very long, and this is like a little, you know, 10 centimeters, eight centimeters, and again, proboscis length has varied, as you would expect. The ones in the red boxes are the ones on Réunion. These are uh, widespread, okay? None is endemic, no moth is endemic to Réunion. It's very interesting. The moth, the, here is the, here is uh, Xanthophan morganii and Xanthophan morganii predictor. And this guy here, very close, well, relatively close, this one here, is the moth with the longest known proboscis, here it is. It's from Costa Rica. Here's the proboscis. All right, so how old are the Xanthophan subspecies on Madagascar and the three Angrecum species that best match the tongue lengths? Huh? <laughs> and I really, I tell you, when, I, when we started this, I, I was completely open. Okay, this is Madagascar, could be old, could be young. Okay, so we inferred from sophisticated molecular clock dating, you know, all sorts of things, everything was done right. Xanthophan subspecies, here is the one on Madagascar, I mean, Xanthophan uh, morganii predictor and Xanthophan morganii borganii, the one on the African mainland and the one on Madagascar, and they diverged from each other 7.4 million years ago, which surprised me. It was quite old, so it could perfectly well be ranked as two subspecies. Uh, anyway, the morphology was right. They are different, these color patterns. They are old. So how old is the orchid? <laughs> okay, the orchid is exactly the same age. It just blew me away. Okay, Angrecum sesquipedale diverged from its sister species 70.5 million years ago. I couldn't believe it. Okay? And as I said before, I will show you a picture in a minute. The sister species looks the same, also has a very long spur. So the long spur could have evolved before 7.5 million years. The other one with the longest spur diverged from its sister 4.1 million years ago. And here's the cricket one. The orchid pollinated by a cricket on Réunion diverged from its closest sister 2.5 million years ago. I was really happy to see that because it's younger or, you know, kind of matches the age of Réunion. Oh, okay, that's nice. <laughs> okay, here are the pictures. Okay, so here is Sesquipedale and it's, it's here, and its sister Longicalcer, and this is Sorium, and his is Longicalcer. They all look the same. Okay. Now, we need to think about how could this evolve? The orchid with the longest 
spur and the moth with the longest tongue, in fact, both match each other in age, 7.5 million years ago. I would never have expected that. You know, I would have been perfectly happy with them having disparate ages and the moth being older and the orchid being younger. No, they are, in fact, old interactions, and probably many of the others are also pretty old. I don't have enough sampling density to tell you this. They are several million year old interactions. And so there is a guild of widespread moths that visits this, these orchids and has clearly been visiting them for some time and has been selecting on them. And I will show you the evidence for this, indirect evidence. So let's l first look, uh, sorry, first look again, I have to go back here, okay, at this deposition of the pollinaria because the plant needs to get its gummies in the right place and multiple times to have a chance for that moth now carrying the gametes to visit the conspecific orchid in the female stage. Because if that orchid is yet still in the male stage with this rostellum thing, the flap, it's not going to work. That second visited orchid must be in the female stage. So it's really you need a lot of visits to get this to work. It's like with uh, human fertilization, you, it's really not easy. Okay, so here are some pictures. Here are some pictures of the pollen deposits, okay? This is all for Angreco morgani epidicta on Angrecum sesquipedale, photographed by Wassertal. And you can see that the pollen is in different places, okay? And here is a predicta on another orchid. And again, the pollinaria, I've marked them with these red lines, are in different places. That makes sense because what I've been telling you about the variation in spur length, the variation in proboscis length, the variation in the nectar spur, male, female, it makes sense that the pollinarium different from what Darwin thought is not always in the same place at the base of the boss. It's not and it doesn't need to be, I think. <laughs> okay, and so here are some more close-ups. Here you can see on this picture, you can see the pollen, but this is just glistening nectar. Okay, and here's another one. Here you can see here they're in the ideal position, like you imagine it from Darwin's text. Okay, but this is a photo of a thing occurring in, on Réunion, and you can see that the pollinaria are deposited in different places. Okay, makes sense. And it also makes sense because these moths are long-lived. Wassertal was keeping Santo van Morgani, a predictor in Erlangen, in a cage for six years. The individual moth lives for uh, six weeks and takes, as he proved and as everybody knows, you know, nectar from many flowers. And even the ones where it pollinates, it would be implausible that it's always at this point, as I, I think I made this clear. All right? And so thinking about this, now we need this again. Okay, variation. I showed you variation in tongue length and nectar length. Okay? And so what evidence could there be for competition. Let me just read this. Pollinators and flowers are in local competition depending on the mucoral frequency. That everybody understands. The orchids are abundant, you know, they are competing with each other for uh, attracting some moths repeatedly. And the flowers, uh, excuse me, the moths probably depending on how many there are and how many flowers there are may also be at some time of the year be competing for nectar, but surely, surely the moths are in the driver's seat because the moths can take its food from various sources, whereas the orchid depends for its sexual reproduction on the moth. So clearly the moths are the drivers. And here are some more pictures illustrating this. This one is on Réunion. All right, so here's the clincher, that there is actual competition. Okay, so let's look from the plant point of view. Here you have the tube length, five centimeter, a 20 centimeter long tube, and here the number of hawk moth visits from this paper. So the longer the tube, the fewer hawk moth visits will come. That makes sense. The ones that are tiny, tiny, tiny will not come to a flower with an eumongous tube. That makes sense. It's trivial almost. This one, not so trivial. So here is the hawk moth tongue length, and here's the number of plant species visited. It makes no difference for the moths with the short tongue and the moths with the long tongue visit the same 
number of different flowers, okay? And if you look at tube lengths and nectar uh, amount, nectar volume, it's also trivial. The longer the tube, the more nectar. But here's the clincher. Here is sugar content. Here is tube lengths and sugar content. Okay? And you can see, wait a minute, I, have, I thought there was a here. Tube lengths and sugar content. Yes, exactly. There are two graphs, one from Madagascar and one from Yaounyo. So tube lengths and sugar content. This is the clincher. The longest spurred orchids offer nectar of much higher sugar content. And why would you do that? You have the long spur, you have more nectar to offer. It would be great, sufficient. But no, you have the long spur and higher sugar content, which of course is a cost to the plant. And this can only be understood if these plants with the longer, these flowers with the longer spurs are actually wanting to be super attractive for somebody to please come and take their high quality nectar. And this is true both for Africa, these data from Africa, and these data from, the other one was mainland Africa, and this from Madagascar. This lacks the line. So I think the experiments that are needed now, very much needed, are to put sensors on the moss, like done here by Martin Wilkelski in this picture. This is obviously not from Madagascar. And cameras on the flowers, so we can see what happens at night to really see who gets visited by whom and how often to really tease apart this network, this guild of orchids interacting with the flowers and the flowers competing by offering the highest concentration sugar in the longest spurs. So here are the answers to the questions I posed in this talk and the questions were what is special about Réunion and Mauritius and the diverse pollinators and are there, you know, how does it relate to local radiations. So far, no local radiations and very few endemics have been discovered. I underlined so far because this very much depends on molecular phylogenies, which are missing for one of these large genera, uh, Synorchis. Okay, we may discover local radiation. So far, they haven't been discovered. And also for the endemics, the more you sequence from African species and Madagascan species and uh, Muscarine species, you, you have a chance to discover whether they're the endemic or where they came from. So far, radiation, play, excuse me, radiation plays no role in a few endemics. Species manage to coexist by occupying different pollinator niches, and I think this is demonstrated, exactly like Thierry Payet said on Monday. Some 70 of the 200 orchids on Réunion and, Ma and Mauritius appear to be moth pollinated. And although I have extrapolated this number from the spur length, I do think it's a fairly good, probably conservative evidence, uh, number. So that would be, you know, a large proportion are moth pollinated. The moth fauna I think is proportionally richer than that on other tropical islands. The data would have to ask Richard Kitching, but it is definitely Réunion is very rich in moths and long-tongued moths. And many moth orchid pollination interactions probably are quite old. I'm out on a limb here because we have dated so few, but at least the key one, the one studied by Darwin and Wallace, is 7.4 million years old or older. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I want to thank Dominique Strasberg and Claudine for inviting me here. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Susanne, for a, a really a super interesting talk. And now we have 12 minutes for questions, so please go ahead. There's one in the back there. Okay, okay here and then over there. 
thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Susanne, we are going to begin with this here. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I wanted to ask you uh, one uh, particular thing. I was thinking, is it possible if there is any kind of data that you could take uh, DNA out of the pollen, out of the flower, and still can trace back the DNA of the moth pollinating ah, that? Ah, that? Like an eDNA sample. Yes. That hasn't been done. Orchid pollinaria have been sequenced for fif even 15 years ago, people did that. But to see whether there is, I don't think so because the pollinarium, the pollen package is not in physical contact with the surface of the moss. You have this, you know, this little bluey part there. But still the, it's- The it's pollen package is on a stalk and the stalk is on a gluey part on the moss. So I don't think. But maybe moth is living some kind of DNA trace in there. I think it's impossible. <laughs> okay, thank you yes. very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Alex Sitzka, University of Leipzig, Germany. Um, one potential problem for these long spurred um, orchids are nectar thieves. So for example, mammals or birds that pinch the spur. Yes. Um, do you think the absence of these um, thieves on islands due to dispersal limitations could be related <sighs> to this, the, the yes. co-evolution of the moth and the orchid? It's an interesting idea. I have no data on that. And it should be possible in herbarium specimens to see whether the spurs have been damaged. I have not personally seen it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It is an amazing, I want to say it's an amazing, we can say almost escalation that these long spurs have evolved repeatedly as I tried to show you. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. they obviously deal with it. They deal with whatever costs come from having a super long spur and having to produce high quality nectar in it. It's more sugar rich than the nectar offered in the short spurs. And that's how these long spurred crazy orchids get that moth to do all the, you know, all the work it has to do to get its proboscis is because that nectar is so good. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, um, the question of, of whether or not Reunion is over rich or exceptionally rich in moths is actually a much harder one than you would imagine. Yes, it has a rich moth fauna, yes, but it's one of the very few tropical islands where we actually know what the moth fauna is. Yes. And this is one of the accidental consequences of rather out-of-date colonial practices of putting a bunch of people with European-style natural history interests on yes. a tropical island. Uh, and thanks to just two people, uh, the well, two recent people, we now have this wonderful list for reunion. The reason I studied moths here was because that list existed. Uh, yeah, I yeah. don't know, and I'd love to hear privately from other people of any other islands where there is a comparable list. We might be able to do it with selected families, but um, reunion is exceptional in terms of the level of knowledge. Right. I, and that reminds me of one other thing. Those you said there are 800 species of moths, including all these tiny galakids and so on. But these moths, all, at least the ones that are a little bit larger, they all take nectar. They do. Yes. Okay? Yes, so that means somebody is providing that nectar. Mm. So to have a moth pollination system on Aeon not only in these orchids, got to be a fairly good thing. Yes, besides the uh, nectar thieves, there is another possible uh, biological interaction to be considered. I remember those photos of spiders waiting on yes, the flowers <laughs> to catch the, the yes. moss. So th yes. for the moss, it yes. would be advantageous to I, I do want to show this. This is yeah. in the dis I have two slides on that because I okay. love Tilo Wassertal's work so much. And if people see whilst you ask your question, uh, monsieur? Can't do it here. 
Oh, yes, maybe I can. Sorry, 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 sorry. Here, yeah, yeah, I have it. Sorry, sorry. Here, here we go, here we go. This is what you were referring to. Please ask your question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's so I wonderful. I mean, that, that could influence the, the evolution of proboscis length. Exactly. Because for a moth, it would be advantageous to stay away from the flower. That's right. Uh, and, and you obviously have taken that into consideration. I absolutely <laughs> have. Thilo Wassertal is an insect physiologist, and one of his discoveries is what you were just referring to, namely that many sphingids want to stay, that the selection on the long proboscis is from the predators waiting, the jumping spiders and other predators, waiting near the flowers. And so the longer your bosses, the more you can stay away from the flower while drinking. <laughs> okay, this is Troboscopus pictures made on in Gran Canaria by, by Wassertal. This does not apply to Angrecum sesquipedale. Xanthophan morganii does not engage in this spring, in this hovering flight. Okay, so it, that's why I didn't bring it. But this again takes me back to Darwin because Darwin, he was so great. With the selective factor that Dar on the long proboscis that Darwin imagined need not come from the long spur. It could come from something else. Okay? So here the selective factor, the factor selecting on the long spur is the predator waiting on the flower. But Darwin had it in his text. It does not explain Xanthophan Morgani predicta. Okay, there is time for more questions. Are there more? Yes. Coffee is not yet ready, so please <laughs> go ahead. And if you want this historic video, please email me. It needs to be distributed. Okay, so it seems that. No, I, I, I was that more, if that is more nice slides prepared, we would love to see them. There's a nice story there. I have the slide about the proboscis <laughs> and the sensory papillae. Okay, this picture, this video, is another video. It shows us, I mean, I go back, I don't want to show the video. The proboscis in these sphingids, as Roger Kitching, of course, knows, is very rich in sensilli, so it is possible for the moth to perceive the sugar concentration. This is a work from Manduka Sexta and the genes expressed in the proboscis that have to do with the perception of sugar quantity. So it's not just a story. There was yes, my question was uh, considering uh, as a follow-up question to this uh, spider thing. Uh, is there any data from Reunion or Madagascar on those spiders actually foraging of the, on the moths? Yes, from Madagascar, yes. Because Professor Tilo Vassertal is his name, he's up, you can email him, okay? He's very super in communication. Yes, he has absolutely documented the jumping spiders on the flowers and his flight cages there. And everybody who has worked on uh, flower, on, on pollination, knows that there are lots of cryptic spiders jumping on whatever insect approaches, also bees, wasps. So it's not a story, this is true. He has not documented it on Réunion. So <laughs> how... Yeah. One of the very few groups in addition to rats which we know well in Réunion are spiders. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So how amazing would be adding the phylogeny of the spider then <laughs> to all, all of that? Probably can be, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think that it has been a wonderful talk and a wonderful discussion. So again, I will call for an applause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and it's time for coffee. Merci.